Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Alzheimer's Association Latino Community Forum. My name is Dr. Angela Goins. I'm an assistant uh, uh, professor of social work here in the College of Public Service. I'm also the director of the uh, Service Teaching Aging and Research Lab, also here in the College of Public Service. Just a little bit about our lab. We, um, we promote issues impacting older adults, policies that support healthy aging, a better trained senior services workforce. We offer opportunities to our students here at the University of Houston to work with seniors, which includes uh, the Adopt-A-Grandparent program where our students can call seniors in their home. That was a valuable um, partnership that we have with the collaboratory uh, on aging and re re uh, resources. Uh, they worked with us on that. We're still working together, and that's one of our biggest uh, volunteer opportunities for our students. So we just thank uh, our partners that are here for that. Also, we're working with the WellMed Community Program where our students will call and have food delivered to our seniors in the community with WellMed paying for that last week of the month because, as many of you know, a lot of our seniors have uh, food insecurities, especially at the end of the month when they run out of their social security. We also have the Christian Community Service Center that offers clothes, rent, utility assistance, where our students can volunteer for that. We also help with caregiver resources, hooking our own U of HD community to resources that help um, our faculty, our staff, our students who are caregivers taking care of their older loved ones. And we're also applying for grants in the Houston Harris County area that are gonna help us work with groups like adult protective services, multi-service centers, so that we can work together for the, for the good of the seniors in our community. So I would like to introduce to you right now my awesome Dean, Dr. Jonathan Swartz, who is the uh, Dean of the College of Public Service. Thank you, Dr. Goins. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, so it's exciting to be here. So I'm John Schwartz, the Dean of the College of Public Service at University of Houston downtown. We are the second largest university in Houston, most diverse university, not only in Texas, but in the Southern region. So, so I'm, I'm uh, really excited to be at this university and to be in the College of Public Service. Our fo focus is education, criminal justice, and social work. And our real focus is equity and justice in all those areas. That's what we think about a lot, especially in our social work program. Uh, and so we are thrilled to have President Blanchard here with us. My real job is to introduce him. Uh, he came to us from the CSU system and he is now at University of Houston downtown, has set a strategic plan that is so synergistic with what we care about in the College of Public Service and what we care about in the city of Houston. So we're thrilled to have him and he's gonna do the welcome today. So President Blanchard, thank you. Thank you so much. It's a, a great pleasure and always easy for me to be here in the College of Public Service. Um, I uh, first of all want to be able to provide the welcome, obviously, to those of you who are here in person. Uh, but we fully know that we have a, a, a great online presence here today as well. So those of you participating online, welcome and thanks for being here today. Uh, tonight really is it. it just happens that the opening of the Star Lab, which I'll tell you a little bit more about very shortly, coincides with the first of a number of events uh, that we are hosting here at the University of Houston downtown uh, that gives uh, pays homage to the National Hispan Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, and I could not think of any better way to kick it off for us here uh, at the University of Houston downtown with the work that we plan to get accomplished through the Star Lab. Um, before I talk more about it, I certainly want to both acknowledge and thank and congratulate uh, our Dean, uh, Dr. Schwartz, as well as uh, Dr. Angela Goins, uh, who is like the, the brainchild for uh, this STAR Lab. Uh, she also serves as Assistant Professor of Social Work, and she will serve as the Director of the Lab. Uh, and also Mr. Stephen Villano, who will serve as the director, who serves as the director of the Center for Public Service and Community Research. All three of these individuals really have poured themselves into the, the concept um, and then now moving it into fruition uh, really feels good for the social work department, but that more importantly, it feels good for the university and the city of Houston. 
So for those of you who may not be aware what STAR stands for, we could probably test you today and uh, ask you to raise your hands. And uh, if you win, you get a nice, uh, sweet treat. Uh, and for those of you participating online, we'll send it to your homes. That's a joke, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, STAR stands for Service Teaching Aging and the Research Lab. And really, I think more importantly, it's designed, uh, which I really appreciate, to promote healthy aging and a better trained senior citizen workforce. Um, and especially amongst underserved populations of people, including the Hispanic community. Uh, so, you know, with that in mind, we know that this place will continue to serve or will serve uh, as a major resource uh, for the city of Houston, as well as Harris County, um, in terms of both services, as well as resources pertaining to senior adults, their caregivers, and the people who work with them. Uh, this vision aligns uh, perfectly, in my mind, with our institutional compass. You heard reference made earlier to our new strategic plan, and there are seven areas that we will be placing our priorities on, and all of those just align perfectly, in my mind, uh, with the purpose of this new center. Um, in many ways uh, as well, uh, there is the, the term that we use that we're not only a higher education urban university that cares about its community, uh, but that it also we strive to be an anchor institution for the city of Houston uh, to really delve into some of the issues that often are tough issues for uh, the city alone to be able to solve. Um, and obviously issues around uh, aging populations uh, here in the city of Houston and the greater region uh, is one of those areas that's tough. But it's really great that we've got uh, individuals not only here uh, at the University of Houston downtown, but our partners as well. And I want to thank who I just met earlier, Sabrina Strawn and Jorge Olvera with the Alzheimer's Association for being here with us tonight to discuss the importance of bringing attention to Alzheimer's disease among older adults and their caregivers in the Hispanic community of Houston. So this really is important for all of us because when we think about the fact of some of the statistics that are out there, we know that uh, Alzheimer's disease affects Latinos in the US at about 1.5 times the rate of non-Hispanic whites. And as a Hispanic and a minority serving institution that we are here at the University of Houston downtown, we're especially concerned about this growing public health threat. And oftentimes we know that so many of our students are either caregivers of their parents, or they're living in households with aging parents, um, and with 53% of the population of students that we serve being from Hispanic backgrounds, that this just couldn't be more timely and important for us here at the University of Houston downtown. So I say again, welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, I look forward to learning quite a bit uh, that I'm sure that we will with the vibrant group that we have before us. And uh, now I'm not sure who I'm turning it over to. Oh, I'm turning it back over to Dr. Schwartz. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Blanchard. You can see how, why we're so excited about his leadership and guidance for the University of Houston downtown. Uh, so I have the pleasure now to introduce Dr. Goins, and I can talk a little bit about her academic ability. She's an assistant professor uh, in her social work department, but more importantly is her heart. And she cares, I think people really are impactful when they care personally and professionally about issues, and that's very true for Dr. Goins. She is passionate about issues for aging for the aging and making a real difference around those issues. And most importantly, she's a kind, thoughtful person who takes a lot of time out of her life to help others, including our students at UHD. So we're thrilled to have her in the college and welcome Dr. Goltz. Yes, yes. And it, it is such an honor to have both President Blanchard and Dean Schwartz here, very important um, in my life as an academic. I couldn't tell y'all any more grateful than I am. So thank y'all very much. Very important, very special to me that y'all are both here. Um, we're excited to partner with the Alzheimer's Association to provide this very timely and important uh, information to our communities across the globe. We would also like to thank all of our partners in publicizing this forum shown on the next slide. 
And I'm going to ask everybody that is from the different ones to please stand so we can acknowledge you. So we're going to start with my partner in crime, Tammy Mermelstein. Uh, she and I have spent many nights trying to put all the aging stuff together at U of HD. For the, she's with the Collaboratory for Aging Resources and Education. Thank you. Uh, East End Communities. Uh, Telemundo Houston. Altus Hospice. Thank you. Bridge Solutions, Bridging Transitions of Care. Center Well Senior Community or Primary Care. Can you have a new name there? Okay. Uh, El Centro de Corazon, the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston. If you like to see. The Hispanic Health Coalition, uh, Legacy Community Health, and Amazing Place. And, uh, and a special shout out to our social worker faculty that are here, my boss, Dr. Don McCarty, and Dr. Dana Smith. Thank you for being here for the social work program. So with, with that said, it's time to uh, introduce you to our moderator today, Mr. Jorge Olvera with the Alzheimer's Association. I'll hand it over to Jorge. I don't know how to get this up. Let's see. You know what? I'll just do this. And I think, does that work? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Goings. I, uh, certainly it's a pleasure to be here with everyone tonight. So uh, thank you for hosting us. Um, I am a proud U of H downtown, University of Houston downtown alumni as well. So uh, very proud to be back. Um, we want to start off by uh, thanking the University of Houston downtown, uh, the College of Public Service, uh, Dr. Stephen Viano, who, who has uh, kindly hosted us, along with uh, Dr. Goins and, and the Star Lab. Um, this meeting tonight, tonight really is a sign for people who are caregiving, right? For those who are caregiving for a family member, also for those who are uh, professionals in the healthcare space, those who are serving and, and have committed their life to serving uh, those who, who have disease or are affected by disease one way or another, and then also those, for those who have a casual interest in the disease, uh, whether that's students like the ones we have before us or who, who may be joining us online tonight um, and have an interest in either going to the profession or maybe caregiving for someone or know someone who is a caregiver. Um, I am going to ask for those of you who are joining us online, if you please remember to mute your microphones. Um, and feel free to use the chat function to participate uh, in this forum. It is a virtual forum, so we would love to hear from you uh, through the chat uh, um, function that's in the meeting. Uh, our colleagues, and, and I'd like to give a big shout out to our, our, my colleagues, Sana uh, uh, and Isabel, uh, for joining us tonight, who will be doing a lot of the uh, chat functioning between Zoom and uh, those of us who are here in person. There we go. Um, so again, the purpose of tonight's community forum is to talk about the impact of Alzheimer's in the community. Uh, we'll start by sharing some basic information and getting everyone on the same page um, on the terminology that we're going to be using and, and kind of the terminology we use to describe Alzheimer's disease, and especially how the disease is affecting the community. It's affecting the places where, where we live, the places where we work, uh, the places where we worship, and really affecting um, everyone that we kind of uh, come across on a daily basis, uh, including some of our colleagues that, that we may work with in uh, the professional space. Uh, one of our goals at the Alzheimer's Association um, is to reach more people nationwide uh, with help and support, making sure that they don't face Alzheimer's alone. Uh, you're going to hear today about staggering numbers of people who have uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, who um, and how those numbers are projected to rise, right? Uh, we're talking about the growth in Houston. We're talking about the change in demographic in Houston. And so Alzheimer's, to a certain ex extent, will start affecting us at a higher rate. Uh, and we're going to hear some of, those, uh, some of those numbers and how dramatic they are. And um, we're going to have a way to bring that home uh, to, to learn a little bit of how they affect us. The first place we're going to start with here 
is um, we want to make sure that we're all on the same page with uh, just kind of very important definitions, right? Uh, we, we talk about Alzheimer's and we talk about dementia, but we oftentimes may not realize the difference between one and the other and how they're connected, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask uh, those of you who are in the virtual space or joining us by Zoom, type in a, into the chat uh, uh, section if you understand the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia. And then I'm going to ask those, those of you who are in the room um, who are not in the professional healthcare space, uh, if you could, one of you raise your hand and, and uh, briefly expand if you know what the difference is between uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. If you don't raise your hand, I'll call on you, so. <laughs> Anyone? Okay, well, seeing none, I will explain uh, what, what the difference is, right? Um, Alzheimer's in itself is the most common cause of dementia. Dementia is an umbrella term, as you'll see on the screen. Um, and dementia is not a single disease, right? It's an overall term that covers multiple diseases, uh, like heart disease, um, that, that covers a wide range of specific medical conditions, uh, including Alzheimer's disease. Uh, disorders grouped under the legal, the general term dementia are caused by abnormal brain changes, right? Uh, these oftentimes are, are due primarily through age, but also has a lot to do with risk factors and things that we have done um, over the course of our lives. Uh, these changes trigger a decline in thinking skills, uh, also known as cognitive abilities, um, severe enough to impair daily life and, and uh, independent function. Uh, some of these things are, are explained through um, feelings, relationships, uh, communication, um, speech, right? So you'll notice a lot of these differences in uh, people who may be developing Alzheimer, whether it's early stage Alzheimer's, uh, mild cognitive impairment, uh, which is uh, kind of uh, happens oftentimes before, before a person is diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Uh, nevertheless, as, as you'll see on the screen, Alzheimer's disease accounts for 60 to 80 percent of all dementias, um, uh, of all dementia cases, I should say. Vascular dementia, which occurs because of microscopic bleeding and blood vessel blockage in the brain, is the second most common cause of dementia. Nevertheless, Alzheimer's is the one that you're going to hear most often. And when a person is not diagnosed uh, with any sort of dementia, it's oftentimes the term that you're going to hear as someone, uh, whether they're developing it or someone saying, yeah, I believe they have dementia when it could potentially be another, I'm sorry, it could be Alzheimer's when it could potentially be another sort of dementia. Oops, let me here. Um, those who experience the brain changes of multiple types of dementia simultaneously have what we call mixed dementia, right? And so that oftentimes happens in, in those who may have vascular dementia but may also develop Alzheimer's disease, for example. And then there are many other conditions that can cause symptoms of dementia, including some that are reversible, such as thyroid problems and vitamin deficiencies. Uh, oftentimes UTI may, may cause someone to... Uh, to be forgetful. And so it's very important that when, when people get, um, see their physicians and in, in, uh, cognitive impairment is an issue, that we cross out what, what those possibilities may be, right? Because some of those may be reversible. Uh, again, uh, thyroid issues may be reversible or vitamin deficiencies is something we can work with as opposed to dementia or um, Alzheimer's. Uh, you might've also heard the term uh, senility or senile dementia, which is what many people formerly called dementia when there was a commonly accepted belief that serious mental decline was a normal part of aging. And so that's a very important thing, right? Um, cognitive decline um, is not exactly a normal part of aging, right? Uh, and, and we see that in people who will develop uh, um, cognitive impairments in early stages of their life in their 40s, and then some who are 90s or in their 90s or 100 years old and are just as sharp as when they were 20 years old, right? And so we see the difference, and so that's, that's what we like to uh, make sure that people are aware that it's not a normal part of aging. Uh, science now knows that there are multiple causes of dementia and many different symptoms, uh, which may include, uh, again, problems with short-term memory, remembering uh, things that happen within the day or within the week, uh, keeping track of a purse or a wallet or things that oftentimes you keep on yourself at all times, right? Uh, for the majority of time. Uh, paying bills, things that happen monthly, and then all of a sudden you start forgetting these things should be you know, done on the first of the month. Um, planning and preparing meals, right? Again, something that, that, that can, uh, people tend to forget. Uh, remembering appointments, getting lost in a familiar neighborhood, which oftentimes in later stages of dementia means getting lost in, within your own home, getting lost within your own family, not recognizing those around you. 
Uh, oftentimes, dementia will start out slowly and gradually get worse. If you or someone you know is experiencing uh, memory, memory difficulties or other changes in thinking skills, uh, you should never ignore those, right? Those should be addressed early on and, and as soon as possible, um, especially when they're identified, because the sooner that something gets identified, um, the sooner they could potentially be diagnosed and the better quality of life that you can give to the person with the disease, as well as the caregivers and the entire family who are part of their daily life. Um, we always recommend to see a doctor uh, soon to determine the cause of, of forgetfulness if it's, if it's something that's uh, seen in a family or, or a friend. And also to get connected to help and support to answer your questions uh, to guide you through the diagnosis. Again, diagnosis is very important because uh, there are many resources available to those who are diagnosed, especially to those who are diagnosed early, and especially when you can treat some of those symptoms early, again, to better the quality of life for those who, um, who live uh, around this person as well as the person who, uh, who has the, the, the potential disease. Um, so when we, learn, when we learn more about dementia, it's common for people to wonder if they're at risk. So we're gonna talk a little bit about risk factors, right? And, and as we think about risk factors, I want you to think about uh, risk factors that we all, may, we all may potentially know are very specific to minority communities. In this case, we're talking about the Latino community, right? And so there are certain risk factors that uh, genetically they may be more prone to. And so think about those as we talk about the risk factors uh, of dementia in itself, and then how those overlap and how they may create different issues for families uh, and um, caregivers as well. So the known risk factors for Alzheimer's are, number one, age, right? Most people who develop the disease are over age 65. So it's a very common theme that it happens as, as folks age. Now, dementia and Alzheimer's is not a part of aging, right? So again, age is a risk factor, but it's not the reason why uh, you develop this, this disease. Family history. Uh, another uh, strong risk factor is family history. Those who have a parent, a brother, a sister, uh, with Alzheimer's are more likely to develop the disease. So again, it's very important for those who um, uh, may potentially have the disease to be diagnosed so that two generations later, their family knows that this was something that they may be at risk for, right? So it's very important for the diagnosis to happen. Um, heredity. Scientists know, scientists know uh, that genes are involved in Alzheimer's. Two categories of genes uh, influence whether a person develops a disease. Uh, the first one is risk genes, and the second one is um, deterministic genes, right? Uh, then, then the last one is head injury. There's a link between head injury and future risk of dementia. Uh, you have to protect your brain by, by uh, buckling your seatbelt at all times if you can, wearing your helmet when participating in sports, and fall-proofing your home when possible. The Alzheimer's Association is very proud to have a national partnership with the NFL Alumni Association. You can guess why, right? Many of the, of the athletes are um, spending five-year careers, 10-year careers, 15, 20 years, maybe more if you're Tom Brady, uh, you know, getting hit on the head. And so it's very important for, for, for us to partner with organizations like them who are um, kind of exposed to some of these risk factors through head injury. On the other side, it's, it's very important for us to uh, partner with those who work in, in uh, the aging space so that we also communicate this message to them. Uh, some of the strongest evidence uh, links brain health to he uh, heart health. And uh, this connection makes sense because the brain is nourished by one of the body's richest networks of blood vessels. And the heart is responsible for pumping blood through uh, these blood vessels uh, to the brain. And so there's a saying that uh, whatever is good for the heart is good for the brain. And so when you think about uh, ways to address the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, uh, think about what's good for your heart. Exercise, healthy eating, uh, getting a healthy dose of sleep, uh, making sure that uh, uh, you know, you, you are socially engaged. All of these things are very important, especially as you age. When we think about uh, aging parents or age, aging uh, family members who may be removed from social spaces because of age or because of cognitive decline or because of physical uh, 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 disability or inabilities to, you know, different abilities, I should say, to be out, uh, consider that the social engagement is very important and, and can certainly be a risk factor in developing um, uh, Alzheimer's or any another sort of type of dementia. Uh, the risk of developing Alzheimer's or vascular dementia appears to be uh, increased by many conditions that damage the heart and blood vessels 
And again, these risk factors, as you think about it culturally, uh, include heart disease, diabetes, stroke, high blood pressure, uh, and high cholesterol. Again, issues that some of our minority communities, in this case, we're talking about the Latino community, have to deal with, whether it's genetically or because of cultural values or because of oftentimes access, right? Uh, we, we can always look back to uh, uh, some of our minority communities who may not have access to healthy food, food security, right? Who may not have access to, uh, um, who may be overwhelmed by unhealthy food, what we call food swamps, right? The, St the Starbucks or the uh, 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 McDonald's or the $5 pizza that may be the only thing they can afford. All of these things are, are certainly an issue. And so uh, we always ask that you work with your doctor to monitor uh, your heart health and, and treat any problems that may arise. Uh, it's estimated that one in three seniors are gonna die with Alzheimer's or another sort of dementia, right? Which is, which is a very uh, high number, right, for, for uh, our population as we think about our, our baby boomers who are aging and who are retiring, you know, uh, in mass quantities uh, each and every day. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death in the U.S., right, which is very alarming. Uh, it's the fifth leading cause of death for those uh, age 65 and older and for women of any age. So what that essentially means is that um, Alzheimer's um, is a women's issue, right? And so as we think about the women in our, in our lives, as we think about uh, minority women in our lives, African-American, black women, as we think about Latino women, um, not only are they um, uh, uh, kind of predisposed to having Alzheimer's at a higher rate because of, of their uh, uh, ethnic background, but also just being a woman simply, right? And so it becomes a woman's issue for that reason as well. I'm gonna uh, share here a little bit, and in, in, uh, I think it was Dr. Blanchard who shared some of the statistics earlier about Alzheimer's and how it's really affecting uh, our, our minority communities, right? Um, in addition to the main risk factors for the general populations uh, that we kind of shared earlier, that's kind of the, the, the risk factors for all uh, to develop Alzheimer's or another type of dementia, Hispanics and African Americans and women are at higher risk for Alzheimer's. Research shows that older Hispanics are about one and a half times as likely as older whites to develop Alzheimer's um, and other dementias, while older African Americans are about twice as likely to develop the disease than older whites. Again, this is an alarming rate because as, as we um, think about our communities, oftentimes they have been disenfranchised or they have been uh, kind of uh, not had the same amount of access to services or have had different barriers to services. Um, all that added to the risk factors, right? And so it, it becomes kind of a, a scary thing as we age and as we talk about our uh, minority communities. Now, the reason for these differences is not very well understood, uh, but researchers believe that higher rates of vascular disease in these groups may also put them at greater risk for developing Alzheimer's. And um, that also speaks to the importance of minority communities being involved in research, right? We, we are oftentimes um, kind of underrepresented in research, uh, which is very important in finding uh, kind of clues to, uh, to understanding Alzheimer's and dementia, to finding solutions, to finding ways to better care give, to finding ways to better support families. Um, one of the things uh, about, um, I, guess, I guess, Alzheimer's, and especially here in Houston, we're talking about the, the growing um, uh, Latino population in Houston, and we, of course, heard the statistic of uh, over 50% of, of the students at the University of Houston downtown being Latino, is that many times the families that arrive in Houston may be undocumented. And so their access to healthcare services or their access to culturally sensitive uh, healthcare services may be limited. Sometimes health insurance may be limited. And so that's why it's very important to make sure that we have these conversations like the one we're, we're having tonight. Uh, we're also gonna, I'm gonna share a little bit about uh, the impact on caregivers, right? Uh, those of you who are joining us, vir joining us virtually or through Zoom, um, Many of you may be caregivers, right? Students at the University of Houston downtown may be caregivers, and perhaps is the reason why they joined us tonight. Uh, oftentimes, they're sandwich generation caregivers, those who are caring for their children, as well as caring for an aging parent. Uh, they may be uh, students who are um, caring for their, um, their grandparents, right? Often uh, translating or often interpreting 
uh, for them, uh, being uh, first-generation college students, but also uh, uh, interpreting at the doctor's office. And so those stressors that come with that as a sandwich generation caregiver are, are, are something that could be overwhelming when, again, you're a student uh, trying to get through college. Um, uh, so one of the things that, that kind of um, compounds the, the burden of dementia and, and it's also the, the disease trajectory People age 65 and older survive an average of four to eight years after a diagnosis, right? Again, four to eight years after a diagnosis, yet some live as much as, much as 20 years with the disease. Nevertheless, uh, the, the person with the disease does decline over time, right? And so their ability to care for themselves declines, which means that it puts a, a bigger burden on that caregiver, who man, uh, once again, may be a sandwich generation caregiver, maybe a student, maybe a parent, maybe a husband or a wife or a spouse, uh, you know, who, who may be a full-time employee. Um, uh, individuals with Alzheimer's will spend an average of 40% of their time in dementia's more severe, most severe stage. And that most severe stage oftentimes is a place where they can no longer care for themselves. Uh, the long duration of the disease contributes significantly to the public health impact of Alzheimer's and the cost of the disease and the burden on caregivers, right? And that burden on caregivers, again, is a stressor, right? Uh, if you think about the mental health, and many of you who have been a caregiver, uh, even uh, some of us, myself being a caregiver for my wife after she gave birth, the stress of being able to support her as she was going through that phase of her life um, is, is minimal to, to the, I would imagine, the stress of caring for someone who uh, has a cognitive decline that may last between, again, four to eight years, or as many as 20 years, right? Um, there's new findings uh, that reveal that the growing toll on Alzheimer's caregivers, uh, reveals more, about, sorry, about the, the growing toll of Alzheimer's care, on Alzheimer's caregivers. In 2019, more than 16 million uh, Americans provided an estimated 18.6 billion hours of unpaid care. Again, that's unpaid care, right? Uh, if you put a monetary amount to those 18.6 billion hours of unpaid care, that's valued at nearly $244 billion, right? And so when you're a, um, uh, uh, a person who is struggling to pay for college or has a full-time job and you are doing unpaid caregiving, uh, that causes an extra stressor, right? Because you may have to take uh, off of work one day or you may have to take class uh, off, or maybe you, you're paying for caregiving for your aging parent, uh, but that limits your, your caregiving uh, um, amount for your child who may be in daycare, right? So caregiving in itself is an issue because unpaid caregiving is an issue. Uh, now, if you think about that, for most Americans, uh, that most than families spend, this is more than families will spend, sorry, on college tuition or even a mortgage. Right. Uh, if you think about the unpaid, give, unpaid caregiving that a family uh, does, uh, that amount of money that you are essentially working uh, is, is, is or could be the equivalent of, again, uh, caregiving for your child, for your mortgage, or even a college tuition. Right. And, and which is uh, very interesting because, you know, tonight's uh, event is happening at, at a university, an institution of higher education. So when we think about those students, when we think about you who's joining us through Zoom and you're a student, um, these are the, the kind of the potential uh, things that are happening to each and every one of you. Now, um, I'm going to ask, and, and those of you in the room, and again, those who are, who are joining us virtually uh, through our Zoom meeting, if you would raise your hand or share it in the chat, and those who are here in person, to, if you could just kind of show your hands or raise your hand, how many of you know someone who has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or another dementia? Just by a show of hands, um, I would say, and, and I know those of you who are, who are joining us virtually may not see the room, but I would say about 80% of those in this room uh, in person uh, have raised their hands. And I assume that if that's about 80% of those of you who are joining us on Zoom, that is a very large amount, right? You know someone who is going through these stressors. You know someone who's being affected financially by unpaid caregiving. You may know someone who is uh, being affected emotionally by being a caregiver, or may know someone, um, again, who is dealing with the disease themselves. Uh, now let's take a moment to kind of, as, you know, as we look around and we see who's in the room, and as you look around and see who's joining us virtually, consider how widespread the impact of Alzheimer's disease and dementia can be, 
right? It's a conversation that we don't have very often, but 80% of the room knows someone who's, who's living through uh, caregiving uh, for someone with dementia or may have dementia uh, or Alzheimer's disease themselves. And again, we invite those of you who are joining us through Zoom uh, to please chat and, and let us know if you know someone with dementia, share your stories, uh, um, uh, type in their names, honor them by, by mentioning their names and making this uh, a conversation to be had, right? And so again, we encourage you to, to uh, uh, have that conversation and, and type their names into the chat so we, that we know who they are. See, one of these is a mouse for this computer. Here we go. Um, I'm gonna uh, play a video here in a minute to, to give you uh, just a little bit more uh, education, but uh, in Latino communities, Alzheimer's and dementia have affected uh, many of us, uh, but worldwide, the numbers are very, very staggering, right? Um, we're gonna take a quick look at a, at a brief video which highlights why the work we do is so important, uh, why it is important for you to be involved uh, in, in uh, encouraging those around you to be educated, and, and you know, especially now more than ever, and this video is, is part of the Alzheimer's Association and uh, Alzheimer's Disease Facts and Figures Report, which provides an in-depth look at the latest statistics on Alzheimer's disease uh, prevalence, the mortality, caregiving, and the cost of care, some of which we've talked about already. I'm gonna play this and uh, make sure that it's playing. <laughs> Thank you. And so again, you, you saw some of the staggering facts and, and kind of figures around caregiving and just the way that Alzheimer affects the community. Um, now we're going to hear uh, briefly for um, one of Alzheimer Association's community educators. Uh, her name is Ana Veloz. She's, uh, she's going to share a little bit about her family and how her family viewed Alzheimer's and um, how she, she has since decided to take action by being involved with the Alzheimer's Association and being an advocate. My name is Ana Veloz, and I am a volunteer as a community educator with the Alzheimer Association uh, for the Houston Southeast chapter since 2018. Um, the first time I became uh, aware of what is Alzheimer and dementia was in 2017. I was taking a class to become a certified uh, community health worker promotora. And one of the classes was about the 10 signs of Alzheimer's. Uh, but that time I didn't know anything about Alzheimer, but it hit me because in the early 70s, my aunt Emilia started showing changes in her behavior, started losing her memory, and we didn't know what was going on with her. As you know, as uh, Hispanic, we have this stigma that when something is not going right in your head, you are going loco, you're going crazy. So that's what we thought that she was going crazy. And I was uh, afraid that that will happen to my dad or maybe to the other siblings. Uh, my aunt Emilia, uh, she has this uh, Alzheimer's disease for around seven years. In 2017, in that class that I get about the, the 10 signs of Alzheimer, it, it opened my eyes of what happened with Aunt Emilia. She had Alzheimer and we didn't know it. So, uh, 
since that time, I got interested in knowing more about the Alzheimer's disease. And I uh, participate in the classes, in the volunteer training that the Alzheimer's Association has. Also by the program of promotoras that the Alzheimer's Association implemented. And that is how I became a community educator for the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, another another uh, reason for me to be a volunteer with the Alzheimer's Association is because knowing that we Hispanic have are in a very high risk of becoming of having the, the disease, I got interested in educating my community. The whole community, but especially the, the Hispanic community, because I know the culture, because I know the language, because I know how we have stigmas for generation that stop us to look for help for uh, mental health diseases and for other diseases too. And it's not because we don't want to, it's because the challenges that exist that we need to face to, to first the fear and the stigma. Then there are some other challenges like who gonna take care of my kids or my, my loved one, where I go to a class, where I go to a, to a support group. Uh, how I gonna get there? Sometimes it's transportation. I don't know. I don't drive. I don't have the, the means to, to go. I don't have a computer to have, to be in a Zoom, in a Zoom meeting. And these are the challenge, some of the challenges that our community have. And I would like, you know, to, to help them to, to defeat those challenges and to know that there is help, that there is people that care, that we have the resources to help them and, you know, to be aware that we are here to help them. And that's why I became a volunteer. Also, I like about the Alzheimer Association, all the programs that they have to educate the community, to help us get better, to bring the message to the community. And it's a very complete and very good program that they have. And that helped me to be, you know, a community uh, educator for my community and for all the people that need it. So I appreciate all the help and that I have, and I love to do this work to help the community. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you, Anna, and, and certainly for, for sharing her story and, and for letting us know, um, kind of, again, the difficulties and the barriers that she and her family have had to endure to uh, address the issues that, that Alzheimer's kind of uh, has brought to the forefront in their family. Um, so this portion, now that we've kind of uh, kind of set a ground for, for what Alzheimer's disease is, how it affects the community, how um, it uh, uh, not only affects us directly, but affects us indirectly oftentimes in the workplace, uh, we're, we're going to talk a little bit, or is the time when we, we move into the conversation piece, right? Uh, this is where we want to hear about your experiences uh, with the disease, uh, especially those of you, again, who are joining us virtually through uh through Zoom, we want to hear your experiences, how it's affected you, um, uh, kind of hear how it's affected your community, right? And uh, it's affected the places where, where you live, your neighbors, your, the, the places where you work, your peers, right? Uh, the places where, where you worship. You know, does your, your congregation have a senior congregation? And how does it affect them? And so that's, that's experiences that, that we want to hear about. Um, one of our goals as an organization is to reach more people nationwide uh, with the help and support of uh, each one uh, of you. And so you've heard today about staggering numbers of people who have the disease and how those numbers are projected to rise, uh, especially in a growing population. Um, if we're ever to help people through this challenge, we need your input in, in being uh, um, to help us understand the condition in your community and come up with solutions to reach, to reach more people. Um, as you heard at the beginning, or as you, you heard Dr. Goings at the beginning, we partner with organizations, some of whom are here today, uh, to raise awareness about the disease, but also raise awareness about risk factors, raise awareness about early detection, raise awareness about engaging people early on. Uh, and it's very important, important for us 
to engage with all of those organizations because they also engage seniors that the Alzheimer's Association may not have access to. And so the first question that we want to ask, and again, uh, I'm going to ask those of you who are on Zoom to type in uh, what, what you think they are. The first question is, what are the barriers, right? We, we talked about Alzheimer's disease. We talked about the challenges of it. We talked about how much it costs a caregiver and unpaid caregiving. We talked about uh, different barriers that communities have uh, due to their ethnic background or barriers in access, or we talked about uh, you know, how their documented status may be a barrier. But what are, what are the other barriers that people have to services? And so that's... Yes, if anyone has any uh, please uh, input from the room, I can pass the mic around, and then we'll also take input from uh, our guests online. So as Jorge was asking, uh, what sort of gaps do you see or barriers? Anyone here in the room? Because I know you've all worked with people who are dealing with these issues. Please. Amy? I think one of the, the gaps or challenges is the stigma. Um, you know, the idea of if you say someone has Alzheimer's, kind of the weight of that word. And so there are a lot of people who are afraid to, to get that label. And so in doing so, they don't go for testing, they don't go for services, um, and, and then they don't get what is available to make the journey easier for them and their families. Excellent. So we've heard stigma, and we actually heard that uh, in our video. For those of you who are able to hear Anna, she said in, in her family, they thought that, that people who started to lose their memory were loco. We also had comment online. Hi, Maria uh, mentioned in the chat, a barrier can also be language. For Hispanic people, it's compl complicated to ask for help. We have another comment from Angie, and she said, not understanding the benefits of early detection. If there is no cure, why does early detection matter? Absolutely. So, uh, and again, to answer that question, why does early detection matter, right? We, 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 we talked about why early detection matters, and that is a uh, better quality of life for everyone, for those who are caregiving, uh, again, as well as, as for the person who has the disease. Right, there is uh, a medication that can help um, slow down the progression of the disease, right? And so it gives them a better quality of life, gives them more time with you in the present. Um, again, it, it provides them an opportunity to enjoy life, to, to get to know their grandchildren or to get, get to know their children in a different space. And again, stigma, one thing that, that we, we know is, is an issue in, in many of our communities, especially in the Latino community, as Ana Velo shared in, in, the, in the video. Uh, exactly right. I think um, for a lot of people, linking the lack of cure right now with um, why early detection matters. So we've heard that in a number of places. Anyone else here would have a barrier? Dr. Miwaki. Thank you. So if you hear cancer, people immediately think, oh, death is near. But when you hear dementia or Alzheimer's disease, we don't see that. Death is right there. So they don't put that dementia or Alzheimer's disease as a priority that you must go to see a doctor and things like that. Dr. Miyawaki is sharing about the sense of urgency, right? Uh, the sense of urgency and detecting it early and, and making sure that they're, they're cared for. Um, Isabel is has going to share a couple of comments from online. Victoria from the chat mentioned limited resources such as insurance and those who are undocumented are considered barriers. Patricia would also like to add primary care providers sometimes don't know enough to provide comforting information. Again, a couple of those things is um, in working with, with within the professional healthcare space, making sure that we advocate for culturally sensitive uh, uh, education inside of the exam rooms, educating our own physicians, right? We, we sometimes assume that the phys physician knows everything. Um, and while it may be true in some instances, uh, especially for those who are gerontologists, right, who are in that field, uh, other, others may not be so educated in, in uh, Alzheimer's and dementia and identifying it early. So it's also very important that, that we have those conversations inside of the exam rooms 
Uh, again, looking at language, someone mentioned language earlier. Uh, it's important that we bring this to the forefront um, of those organizations that are serving uh, uh, community members who speak different languages, right? And and some of our partners are here tonight. We, we talked about the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston being our partner tonight. Um, what does that mean in, in the way that they engage their parishioners and, and, and engage their con congregations to educate them, right? Because they're bringing them together. How can we add more value to their meetings uh, outside of religion, but in health, which again, essentially is about better quality of life and having uh, more time with them. I'm gonna, uh, we have a comment here from. Uh, uh, I think a lot of times when I go out and see patients and patients' families, it's just the frustration that they know a lot of stuff about Alzheimer's or dementia, but they can't get any affordable help at all. So a lot of times it's frustrating for them to come to a social worker and talk to a social worker when we have no answers for them. They have no family, they have no support, and they just don't know how they're going to take care of this person. Absolutely. So l let me ask you one question. It's a follow-up question to that is, how do we advocate for, for a response? to like How do we advocate to create a support system? I mean, I think a lot of it has to go to lobbying, especially here in Texas, <laughs> back to Austin, back to our capital, to let them know how important it is to give us more money for health care and for other things that can help people with Alzheimer's, maybe accepting some of those Medicaid dollars that we don't take, um, just so that we can make people understand that we need those services. So, Absolutely. And again, uh, some of those services, essentially, you know, they, they get funneled back into the health care system, which, you know, in, in, would it at least help us uh, develop those healthcare systems and you know make them stronger, I think, uh, well through that reinvestment of money. But again, we talked a little bit earlier about caregiving and, and unpaid caregiving, right? And so again, using some of those Medicare mon uh, dollars to support families. And so advocacy is, is very important. I think advocacy is important, obviously at the state level, it's, it's important at the um, national level as we think about elected officials. But again, it's also very important in advocating within our workspaces, talking to our uh, employers, all right, about supporting the health of, of, of their employees. Uh, and not just in Alzheimer's and dementia, but any one of those risk factors that we talked about that eventually could uh, uh, that support the development of, of Alzheimer's and dementia in, in, in later stages. Um, do we have? Uh, we've got a lot of information about the gaps in knowledge and con and uh, lack of resources. Uh, I want to get to, I guess, a really basic question. Is Alzheimer's viewed as a concern in the Hispanic or Latino community? We've got, I, I, okay, if you're shaking your head, I'm going to hand it over to you. <laughs> um, definitely it's not viewing as a concern. We Sometimes we, as a Latinos, we can see the signs in our loved ones, and we think this is part of the aging, but we don't uh, ask for the resources or, or the uh, health um, attention that they needed to difference between the Alzheimer, dementia, and memory loss. Everything we associate about the aging. So definitely this is making them aware, and where are the resources for them? Thank you. And again, a, a very important point there, right? Uh, Alzheimer's and dementia is not a normal part of aging, right? And, and again, we, it, it oftentimes can happen in some folks as early as 40 years old. Uh, nevertheless, you know, early stage uh, or, or early onset Alzheimer's is not a very, it's not a common thing, right? And it's not a result of aging. Um, I'm going to ask the next question here, kind of uh, what are the signs people will recognize as a cause or concern? I'm going to ask those of you who are on the Zoom uh, meeting to to input your 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 um, your comments. What are the signs people would recognize as cause for concern when someone has uh, mild cognitive impairment who may have developed Alzheimer's or dementia? Uh, and uh, while well, you know some of those comments come in, um, I'm going to ask those of you in the room. You know, what are the signs that people see? What are the people? What are the signs that you would recognize um, if you saw someone lost or if you saw someone at the grocery store? Any, any thoughts on that, Eleanor? Just kind of like, you know, what would you recognize it as a sign? Uh, a sign of possible Alzheimer's? Yes. I would say um, frequently, sorry. <laughs> frequently losing keys, getting lost in familiar areas, um, confused as to why they're there. Right. Thing. 
And again, confusion is, is something that happens very often. If you have hand the mic to uh, Dr. Goings. Confusion is some, something that happens very often, right? And again, it can happen for multiple reasons. We talked about earlier about thyroid issues. We talked about uh, UTIs or other things happening. Uh, but confusion oftentimes is, is a very uh, easier way to identify someone who may have some of these uh, uh, cognitive impairment issues. Dr. Goings? So a lot of times... Um when someone's developing dementia or Alzheimer's, it's going to impact what we call their activities of daily living. Uh, so preparing a meal for oneself, um, and I'll give you a perfect example. I knew something was wrong. My dad had Alzheimer's for 10 years. Um, it started very slow. He left the key in the back door and then took off and left the back door totally open. Uh, he left a pot of burnt, uh, I came home one day and the house smelled the burnt eggs. He left the eggs burning he, he went in the other room, forgot he had the eggs burning. He left toast in the toaster, and uh, it just started real small. I'd make him food, leave it in the microwave, call him at noon and say, hey, have you eaten lunch yet? And he said, yeah, it was great. And then I'd get home at 5, and it was still sitting in the microwave. So it's these little bitty signs that start up very slow. And then uh, I immediately had him see a doctor, which is, you know, and they were able to diagnose it early on, and he was able to get on some of the more... Um, helpful medications, but it starts out very small like that. So, Thank you, Dr. Goins, for, for sharing. And, and to the person earlier who mentioned in the chat about the importance of or, or, or why we would want to di you know, diagnose if there is no, no solution or there is no way to care for someone, right? Um, that's exactly it, right? Uh, what Dr. Goins shared about her dad, making sure that you give them a better quality of life, that you detect it early so that that they can live a happier life as opposed to um, not knowing why these changes are happening in their lives. Uh, and again, some of those signs and, and, and changes may be very small, as simple as uh, not eating, right? If any one of you, most of us, um, didn't eat, we would know we didn't eat, right? We get hungry, uh, and we would know we were hungry. But when a person like that uh, who, who has those early stages or may have some of those symptoms, they swear, and you, you can fight them all you want. Um, they swear that they have already eaten, even though their, their stomach may be empty. And so, again, those are the signs that we're looking for. Um, we have one more, one more comment here. To, to piggyback on what Dr. Gowen said, for us, it was um, when our loved one, who was a lifelong baker and cook, tried to put a plastic tray into an oven, into a hot oven, and we stopped her you know, right before it happened, but she didn't understand what she was doing wrong. And this is somebody who spent you know, most of her life in the kitchen. And the fact that she couldn't understand why what she did wasn't right, that was a really big red flag. The other thing was you know, somebody who was good about paying her bills on time, all of a sudden, you know, we would hear, oh, this bill was late. Oh, that bill was late. And, and it was a very, it, it was just a small thing that was out of the ordinary. And it was a sign that there was something wrong. Right. And so as we think about that, think about the frustration for someone who's baked all their life, uh, who is a professional to that extent at baking, uh, to make those, those very small, uh, 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 forget those very small details, right? Uh, and what frustration and what stressor that puts uh, kind of in their mental health, right? How they behave around us because they're frustrated uh, with the fact that they don't know what's going on, right? Uh, we, we've heard the story of, of a college professor who, who was an educated, had a PhD, uh, uh, just always very sharp. But then what happens once he starts forgetting, right? Um, Alzheimer's disease and dementia happen to physicians. It happens to gerontologists. It happens to people who uh, um, have spent their life, researchers, who have spent their life trying to find a solution for Alzheimer's and dementia, they can also develop Alzheimer's and dementia. And so what happens, what does that frustration look like for someone who is a professional baker or a mechanic or something that, that takes a lot of skill and then all of a sudden they start to forget, right? Or someone who's been a, 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 a mother to their children for 20 or 30 or 40 years, but then they can't remember their name. That's the frustration, right? And so what happens there? Um, I'm going to move on to a, 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 another question here. Um, let me, there we go. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the, the role of, of local physicians uh, uh, and, the, and the role they play in connecting dementia patients to their proper resources. Uh, those of you who are on Zoom and those of you who are you know, joining us virtually, uh, I want you to think about your engagement with your physician. 
think about uh, the limited amount of time that you have in there, what that looks like and what that may look like for someone who may be afraid that they, they, they may be forgetting things or have communication uh, concerns or may be developing some sort of uh, cognitive impairment, right? So what role do local physicians play in connecting dementia patients uh, to the proper resources? And we have a few folks here in the room who work in the healthcare space. And so I'm very curious to ask you, what role do physicians play um, in that, you know, in, in making sure that patients have the proper resources? I think it's, it's a very obvious answer to a certain extent, but it's also a very um, good question because we don't always understand what that role is. And so those of you, uh, Sabrina, I don't know if you have a comment. Well, or I was going to make it a little bit more pointed for if anyone wants to share either here in the room or online who have been in a situation where they have a loved one with Alzheimer's disease, are you aware that there, did their physician mention it? Did, or as your loved ones got older, maybe before it even presented itself, is this something that came up? Or if you're in this age category, and I know some of us are getting, I'm getting closer to it, is the doctor starting to ask, do you feel like you've got any memory problems? Has anyone had any experience with that kind of interaction? Isabel, do we have any comments virtually? Make sure we, we provide a platform for those who are joining us virtually. We have a quick comment. Um, Kimberly mentioned that it's so important to advocate for yourself and ask plenty of questions to your doctor. Good. Again, very important. And, and we know that, that um, the time that we have with our physicians in the exam rooms is oftentimes very limited, right? And so you may not have the opportunity to ask all the questions that you want, uh, but I, certainly advocating for yourself is, is important. And I think that's that's the role, right, that some of our physicians play is making sure that they're educated. And I think each of us have a role as we were thinking about advocacy earlier. Uh, Tony talked about advocacy, um, advocating for ourselves inside of the exam room, making sure our physicians know what our needs are and what our questions are so they can be better educated about something specific, right? Uh, I, I don't know that all physicians um, know everything about everything, right? And so advocating and saying, letting your physician know this is important to me and it's important that you know how to answer this question because you're the professional that I come to for these answers. Tony, you have a, a comment? Yeah, I think a lot of times when you start talking to families about possibly going to a doctor that specializes more in memory issues, dementia, those types of things, sometimes the families are very afraid to tell the doctor that they've been seeing for a long time, that they don't trust what that doctor might be doing is correct. So a lot of times they kind of hold off. And a lot of times the physicians will say, well, I can handle everything when they really can't. So it's really teaching these families to advocate for themselves and that you're not going to upset your primary care physician if you feel like you need to go see somebody that specializes in that area. Absolutely. Um, and again, uh, specializing in that area, again, very important, right? Uh, knowing the difference between a primary care physician and a gerontologist or a neurologist, right? And, and where do you go uh, to get uh, a diagnosis or where do you go for services? Um, Isabel, if there's another comment on, online, not just yet, okay. Um, and then again, advocating for yourselves, um, understanding that not, again, not all physicians know everything. So advocating for yourselves and letting them know uh, kind of what's important to you and, and why, what conversation um, you want them to know more about. Do a follow-up, right? We have one comment on here on the far right, if you'll share the microphone, please. Uh, as as, as we, we get the microphone over, uh, one thing to consider, again, is we talked about earlier is um, cultural competency, uh, language, language uh, justice to that extent, making sure that when you go to see a physician, um, ask for the Spanish-speaking physician, right? We're talking about Latinos today, but maybe ask for the Mandarin-speaking physician, right? Or, or ask for the Vietnamese-speaking physician, or identify one that you can better connect with and understand your cultural concerns. We talked about risk factors earlier. Understands your cultural concerns, right? And, and can explain it to you in a way that is not abo uh, over your head and, and makes sense to you culturally. We have one comment here in the room. Um, I was just going to add on with the advocacy because I feel a lot of times people don't know about advocating for their own selves or for their loved one. Um, a friend of mine, her mother just went to the doctor and was diagnosed with a mild cognitive impairment. And 
their physician seemed to kind of brush it off. And so, so did they. And, you know, like one of the slides says that 80% of Americans know little or not familiar with that diagnosis. And I feel like that's particularly why, because they didn't think to ask questions because they went to, oh, well, it, she wasn't diagnosed with Alzheimer's, so it's okay. Or eventually to get better. And I asked them if she is on new medication from that diagnosis and I got to know. So I, I don't think a lot of people know about advocating for themselves or for their loved ones. Absolutely. I sometimes hear that. Uh, so the primary care doctor will recommend you to go or maybe connect you with a neurologist who is a specialist. And also the patient is kind of afraid that do they, my insurance pay for specialist. So that's another barrier to that. They are recommending to go, but they may not actually set an appointment and go and take, so that they can have cognitive assessment and things like that. Absolutely, so you, you hit on two, two things that we talked earlier about barriers. One is uh, insurance. You know, what that looks like for an aging person who may be undocumented in the United States, here in Houston, you know, what does that look like uh, when they get referred to a specialist and, and when they no longer can go down to the clinic um, uh, down the street in the neighborhood, the local FQHC, but now they have to go to the medical center and they have to navigate the medical center in order to gain access to, to a, a neurologist or a specialist, right? And so, again, that, that in itself can be overwhelming uh, uh, sometimes. Uh, and then uh, I guess the, 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 how that connects back to Tony, as we were talking about advocacy earlier, is are you aware of the Medicare benefits for care planning, right? Uh, are you uh, aware of what's out there, what exists? Uh, Sabrina, I don't know if you have a comment on this. Yes, uh, just a quick comment. We've had a request, a uh, couple of requests from online to, to make sure we speak loudly into the mic. And then maybe, uh, Jorge, you can just recap the question uh, just to make sure that we all understand what the question uh, or comments have been. Thank you. And so we re rough, have roughly about maybe three to four questions left, right, in our conversation. And again, the conversation is, uh, we earlier talked a little bit about kind of what are the barriers. Uh, right now we're looking at uh, what, are the, what is the role of local physicians in connecting dementia patients, patients to the proper resources. And again, a, a, lot of, a couple of things that have came up is, again, uh, Medicare and advocacy, right, and how we can advocate for ourselves inside of the exam room, how we can advocate for uh, um, culturally competent uh, physicians, right, that understand our very specific needs in the Latino community, that understand our very specific uh, needs in the AAPI community, that understand our, our very specific needs in the African American community, right, um, that that understand just kind of all of the risk factors that come along and, and kind of what's culturally important to each and every one of us, uh, especially when we think about caregiving, um, why it's important for us to, to caregive inside of a, a multi-generational household if that's what we value as a culture. Right, um, we're gonna uh, kind of move on here to uh, uh, kind of what the uh, role is, and, and the question is, who and uh, what community <coughs> leaders, organizations can best help in addressing the issues of Alzheimer's and dementia? And again, those of you who are joining us virtually or through Zoom, was there? Sorry, Isabel, was there a comment on the previous question? Okay, perfect. Uh, those of you who are who are joining us virtually. Um, you know, this question is for you. You saw also some of our partners who kind of we convened to be a part of, of tonight's conversation, but who else, right? Who else are our community leaders? Who else are the organizations that can help, that can best help in addressing the problems, right? Um, any, any, any thoughts on that uh, kind of here in the room? You know, who are, who are the people that you would suggest can help address the issues? We have a comment from Anna, who's online. She says the faith communities and multi-service centers can kind of help with that. Okay, perfect. Uh, so uh, again, faith communities, you, you saw at the beginning of our, our conversation, one of our partners tonight is the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston. Olga, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Um, that is a great place, right? Um, and so you have, would you mind sharing the, the microphone, Isabel, here with Olga? Uh, right, the, the church community and, and those who are convening people and those who are very trusted, like, like our, our parishioners and, and our leaders in the church. Correct. This is um, parishioners and, and the community always trust in the faith uh, and the congregation of faiths. And we are the leaders from the community. They need to make um, 
make them aware, educate our leaders, training the leaders and the communities to the resources we have. Don't be afraid to reach out your communities for help or for assistance if they need it. I think one of the best um, opportunities that we have here in Houston is a medical center. We do not have any barriers to asking, changing doctors, asking it is the best uh, or, or spread the word out about the resources. So education, make them aware is, is the best uh, um, uh, probably responses for to addressing this problem. Uh, thank you so much for Hal Simon for doing these uh, uh, panels. I'm gonna take it from you there. Thank you, Olga. And again, um, in convening partners and, and kind of uh, educating the community, right? Uh, when you go to your to your uh, um, church or your, or your place, your congregation, and, and you think about uh, whether there's a senior congregation and whether they have education and healthcare. That also is advocacy, right? Talking to your church leaders and saying, we want to welcome the Alzheimer's Association here to educate us, but we also want to uh, welcome uh, 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 the Heart Association, right? And the American Diabetes Association and everyone else that can help educate uh, and use that time and that space that we have in our congregations to add more value to the, the present uh, group that we, we have in those spaces. We have another comment here. And then Sana, do we have any comments uh, virtually? Not yet? Okay, so. Hi, um, so my, I'm actually from criminal justice, so I, I very much enjoy um, this multidisciplinary discussion, but I didn't want to bring in, um, you know, having the conversation about our criminal justice system, particularly correctional systems, doing a much better job of um, working with those who are at that age of, of risk for um, you know, cognitive impairments who are being incarcerated and will likely be released at some point and then back into the community. So working to um, identify those early on as well as transitioning those free entry services to help them get the support that they need um, after long-term incarceration. So before you, you let go of the microphone, I do have a couple of questions, right? Because one of them, well, uh, I guess a comment first is, is certainly uh, as people are being released and they're kind of coming back in, into the community, uh, being kind of re-engaging into uh, access and resources that maybe they haven't been connected to for a long time. Um, how do we, how do we uh, provide an opportunity for those resources to be educated, right? Um, what are the organizations, and I think that's really my, my real first question to you, is what are the organizations that in the criminal justice system, uh, as people come out you know, and, and uh, are being released, who should we be going to? Who are they accessing their 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 um, resources or getting education from? Um, I mean, that's a, a wonderful question, and and I'll probably leave someone out. Um, but I, I do know that many times um, correctional facilities have reentry teams and specialists who are trained to to help make some of these connections, um, as well as at the the parole um, offices as as they, if they're continuing to supervise someone, um, are meeting with them regularly and hopefully should be working to address barriers and help them be re-entered. So it could be at kind of multiple stages, post re-entry preparing and then the actual re-entry phase. Okay, well, not, let, let me ask you this, as you, you talked about uh, parole officers. Um, I think that could potentially be, right, uh, obviously one, but police officers. You know, I, I don't know if that, that sort of, I know we provide that sort of training to certain uh, departments. I don't know if you're kind of aware or, or if that's something that's talked about in the criminal justice space. I'm I'm on the correction side, a correction okay. scholar, um, so I can't I can't speak to that. But 100 percent, as as they're coming in contact with community members and um, those who have you know justice involvement history, may be more likely to come in contact with police. So it could very well be uh, a good resource. I see Dr. Goyen's hand up. Thank you, Dr. Bland. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Goins has a comment here in a minute. But again, I'm going to invite those of you who are joining us uh, through Zoom to, again, think about um, who are those community leaders and, and organizations that can best help in addressing the problem of Alzheimer's and dementia uh, in, the, in the community in general, right? But then again, in the Latino community, again, think about risk factors, think about barriers, language, access, uh, uh, documented status. When you think about all those barriers, who are those people that we should be uh, kind of uh, reaching out to? Dr. Goins, you have a, a comment? So actually, uh, I teach one of the CJ grad classes, and, and one of my students in there actually does 
uh, work in the mental health portion of the Harris County Jail. And I wasn't even aware of this until, you know, uh, she has a caseload of like 10 individuals that she works with and provides mental health to. And so I think that beefing up uh, that up more is, is a great idea. I don't know if a lot of people know, but uh, half the prison population in Texas is aging in place. They're like 65 and older. Uh, the chronological age for someone in jail is 10 years more. So like if you're 55, you may be aging like a 65 year old for all kinds of reasons, you know. Um, a lot of people that go into the prison systems have bad health. Uh, and I've actually had conversations with my CJ colleagues here, because uh, we're under the same department, the Department of Criminal Justice and Social Work, uh, and we've talked about doing things together to reach out to that population that's aging in place, where they're seeing a lot of Alzheimer's related issues that's considered a policing issue. You know, a cop doesn't know sometimes if somebody's being disobedient with an attitude or are they just forgetful. And so there's there's a lot of work to be done there, you know, with that population. But but it comes down to money and you've got people in the community who are aging and have mental health issues going on, fighting for the same resources as folks coming out of prison and jail and all that. So uh, I think it's, you know, it, it's going to take a lot to identify those those agencies. But I know the reentry programs, like Dr. Bilal said, are getting better at addressing those issues when people do get released from prison, jail, probation, whatever. So. Correct. Right. In, in, in whatever part of, of the social justice uh, um, uh, system they are and I'm going to take your comment in a second then I, I saw you have a comment as well uh, but certainly yes right and so as we again we think about who are those organizations that we may not think of automatically you know that that would help in in um, providing those resources to providing the education that's that's one place to start please yeah sure so one of the community organizations here in Houston has been up in the front to uh, support uh, the community with reducing the stigma and declining of um, dementia. It's an amazing place. An amazing place has been around for 26 years here in the Houston community, serving especially the person dealing with dementia through our day program and other services that we offered, and along with caregiver support. So we have a lot of those services through a lot of our professionals that provide them in person and virtual. And understanding the need of barriers with our Latino community, we are, we are actually expanding our services to be able to go to the faith-based organizations and churches where we can come in and reduce those barriers by providing those um a program that actually is expanding and starting at coming to the local churches in Houston, providing a Cuidando con Respeto program of information and support to the Latino community in, again, in Spanish and being able to open it up for all family members so that they can become aware of um, how to identify the signs of dementia and along with providing caregiver support. So this is something that we've been actively working in the community and again, Amazing Places being really f trying to figure out ways that we can continue to expand and support our services at, 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 at no charge when it comes to providing and coming into the person's environment. Thank you. We have another comment on, on the far side of the room, and I think we have a couple online, but um, you, no, I think it's, you had a comment, correct? Yeah, uh -huh. okay. Okay. Um, but again, being aware of the resources, right? Again, amazing place in their Cuidado con Respeto program. We have interns here from the uh, Gail Wells Foundation, right? Uh, being aware of, of who's out there, being aware of what resources is closest to you. Uh, uh, and again, being aware that the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, and, and that their, their, their kind of senior leaders uh, may have information available for you. So really just being aware of where the resources are, uh, knowing who's serving the community, and, and again, who's serving them in, in a cultural uh, way that, that addresses language barriers. We have a couple of comments from, from online, right? 
Yes. So some of them are kind of going over organizations that can reach a broader community, just like the sports team. So, you know, a lot of people are fans of the Texans, Astros, Dynamos, um, and maybe they could kind of share information and resources. Um, someone also mentioned a segment or a commercial on Channel 2. So any other local news resources. We also have someone from Prairie View a and and they have a university wellness program with the College of Nursing, and they also educate um, communities in Houston and the surrounding areas on health education, disease prevention, um, and they host workshops, programs, and events at churches and schools and community centers. So we have a ton of great resources online as well as in person. Thank you, Sana. We have another comment here in the room, but again, as we think about where our resources are coming from, as we think about, um, you know, who's entertaining us, you know, during the day, we talked about, you mentioned the Texans or the Astros, right? They're entertaining us during, during the, the, the games and, and the sports, but how do we uh, partner with organizations like that who have a very wide reach in educating, right? There's another comment here in the room. So I would say one of the answers is to go hyper-local. You know, look for the person who runs that little corner shop that might see the same person come in day after day after day and may even be in a better position to notice some changes than maybe sometimes the family does or the beauty shop or other places where people gather in a neighborhood. And I would say start there because one of the things that I've learned in, in working with older adults and caregivers is people won't necessarily want to listen for themselves, but they'll listen for a friend. And so say, hey, look, we're trying to get the word out in case you might know of anybody who has these signs or symptoms. And people many times will listen and then say, oh, I know so-and-so who's just like that. And so if you, instead of, you know, sometimes going broad, go deep and, and find those people in the community and that might help you get the word out better. Perfect. We have a couple of comments here in the room and we're, you know, we're certainly nearing, uh, I think, uh, kind of near the end of the conversation, uh, but we're gonna take a few more comments as, uh, so that we make sure everyone is heard. We have a comment here from Tony. I think also too, thinking from a cultural standpoint, it is really hard sometimes when you're working with Latin males um, because they have so much respect and they don't want people to know that there's something wrong, either with themselves or the wives that they're taking care of. So I think even trying to figure out how you can do some sort of male only, Latin male only groups so that way they can discuss those types of things among themselves and be able to save face Absolutely. and stuff. Cause that makes it really hard when you're working with um, the Latin males. Absolutely. And again, I think looking at, at uh, uh, the hyper-local space, right? We're talking about grocery store. Where, where do those uh, specific populations congregate, right? How can we work with those congregate, congregate, congregating places? right, that those, those they may be at. And some of that could be employers, right? How do we work with employers? Yeah, so piggyback with Tony's comment. What about those people who don't speak the language, right, in English? So maybe for Spanish, you need to have somebody who is representing Spanish, the Latin face, in the con in maybe in the congregation, so they'll trust that person, and also different ethnic and racial groups too. So not only the, the person who has the disease, but the person who is going to be educating has, should have the similar face. So the environment to the listener will be kind of familiar. Like maybe if I'm talking about Vietnamese, Vietnamese doctors, they are the ones who should be advocating for them or who should be educating for Vietnamese communities. So I think it's from both ends, the patient themselves or the family themselves, but also the doctor or healthcare professional, they should be more pro proactive in doing this type of education. Absolutely. And so that actually is a great gateway, I guess, to... Uh, what we're going to talk in a minute about is, is the resources that, that are available both through the Alzheimer's Association and then some of our community partners. Uh, but it also speaks to the importance of volunteership, right? Getting engaged in the fight and getting engaged in the fight does not always or does not only mean supporting financially, but supporting with your time, supporting with your talent, right? So supporting with, with your ability to, to uh, be a support system, a shoulder that someone can lean on. 
that is a, a form of volunteering and supporting uh, the mission of the association as well as supporting uh, 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 the vision of, of a world without Alzheimer's. I think that's a perfect segue okay. to the rest of our slides. We do. We have actually a, about two different slides left. And um, again, the first one is um, how we can help, right? We're, we're going to try to keep it here within the, the time frame. Um, as we conclude our, our, our discussion portion, we want to make you aware of the Alzheimer's Association offers free resources uh, to millions of people facing Alzheimer's disease. Um, the very, very, uh, maybe perhaps most important one, and one that we encourage everyone to make uh, sure that they have saved on their phones, is their 1 800 number. That's 800 272. 3900 available 24 7 available uh, with social workers on the other side of the of the of the uh, of the phone line who can help support you at 3 in the morning when you need the most help or can help support you at 3 p.m. when you have a question um, or you have an issue but you don't know what right you sometimes don't even know the question but you you have something you're dealing with call the number and make sure that you you ask and you find a solution and again, that, that helpline is available 24-7. Uh, we also have uh, free education programs. Again, we talked about how we par we're partnering with the Archdiocese of Houston, uh, Galveston, Houston, as well as so many other partners, Center World, Centro de Corazón, Legacy Community Health, that, that's one of our partners tonight, uh, in educating uh, the community. We have uh, the, also the Alzheimer's Association and AARP Community Resource Finder, right, where you're gonna find resources to local uh, uh, organizations, right? We talked about Amazing Place and the great work that they're doing through Cuidado Con Respeto or, or uh, the Gail Wells Foundation, right? And the great work that they're doing in the community supporting through uh, support groups. So again, you can find those at uh, the AARP and Alzheimer's Association Community Resource Finder. Um, you can also get easy access to dementia resources and community programs and services by going to our website, which is alz.org. Um, and so I'm going to switch over here. Uh, just like Anna shared earlier, uh, many more Alzheimer's Association volunteers have felt compelled to make a difference um, over time, right? By, by giving again of their time and, and giving of their talent and their ability to, to support caregivers and support their community. Uh, volunteers have been uh, at the core of our work since the beginning in, in 1980 when the Alzheimer's Association first started here in Houston. And uh, it was started by a group of volunteers made up of a family of caregivers and individuals who recognized uh, the need. They built an organization to unite caregivers, uh, to provide support to those facing Alzheimer's, and to advance research in the disease, right? This was 40 years ago. And, and today we continue that fight. And today we continue to encourage people to be involved in research, to be volunteers, to help uh, engage their community and educate their peers, uh, whether that's a person sitting next to you on the bus or that's a person that attends, uh, that you sit next to at lunch at work, or it's, it's, it's uh, the people who sit next to you at church, right? Or it's anyone else that you ever have a conversation with, including as someone was sharing in those micro uh, spaces like the guy at the corner store. Um, and so the uh, aging uh, of our population means uh, an under uh, precedented and growing number of people require care and support for living well uh, with dementia, right? The, for living a better quality of life. And the most difficult challenge many fi families will ever face uh, could be Alzheimer's, right? Could be a, a type of dementia. And too few of them have the information and resources that they need to live their best possible life today and, and better plan for tomorrow. Again, better plan for tomorrow includes early detection, addressing risk factors. And um, all of you can help us uh, realize our vision of a world without Alzheimer's and all, of, all other dementia, again, by being involved, bringing the conversation about, uh, making sure that, that we address the stigma uh, of Alzheimer's and dementia, especially in the Latino community, especially in the African-American community, especially in, the, in, in, in our women's circles. Because again, it's an issue for women, it's an issue for minority communities, as much as it is an issue for all other communities. However, some of us uh, are, have a higher rate, higher precedence, because of, of our, our makeup and who we are. Um, so what's next, right? Um, there, there's, uh, uh -oh. 
So you may not know it now, but you, you've shared with us uh, a lot of information that's going to help us, and it's going to help us help others in many different ways. The Alzheimer's Association is going to share this information back to the community and ask each of us to think about how they can reach and help more people, right? In fact, we're, you're going to receive a quick survey as a follow-up in case you think of more ideas uh, for all of us, for in case you think of more ideas for yourself. For me, for, for the person sitting in this room and those of us uh, who are joining virtually, uh, as you think about these things, jot them down and we receive this survey, uh, make sure you let us know so that we can share with all of our partners who you, you met earlier at the beginning of the presentation and they're also aware of how they can better support the community, how they can better uh, support the community. Uh, the Alzheimer's Association has a uh, commitment to serve all communities. Um, inclusion is a core value of the Alzheimer's Association. The Alzheimer's Association believes we must create a society in which people feel safe, in which they feel uh, cared for, and in which they feel valued. Um, so we're gonna continue our work to include all communities and advance health equity, uh, right? Uh, we're gonna do that through, again, engaging partners unusual and uncommon partners like the social justice uh, uh, system, right? And making sure we educate the community. So you, we encourage you to stay tuned with us, uh, stay involved. Um, also, if you're in need of any support uh, or information for a family member, a neighbor, a friend, uh, or anyone else that, that you come across, please reach out to the Alzheimer's Association at alz.org uh, slash care. Um, or you can call our 24-7 helpline at 800-272-3900. Or you can reach out to any of our other partners that we mentioned earlier, and they know how to get in contact with us, and they know where the resources are. So please reach out. Uh, um, we always say that no one should face Alzheimer's alone, and that is a very true statement. Uh, we should not be fearful that we're the only ones dealing with this. As we saw at the beginning of, the, of this program, uh, about 80% of the people in person, and I would assume about 80% of the people virtually, are dealing with this. And so unless we bring it up, um, it, it, it may not, and we may not get the resources, the education that we need. Um, I'm gonna invite Angie to, to join us up here. Uh, once again, uh, Dr. Goings, uh, kind of close us out, and, and again, thank her for hosting us at the University of Houston downtown in the Star Lab as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. That was that was phenomenal, and I hope that that y'all have something to take with you, uh, something to offer families and friends who suffer from this. So, on behalf of the Service Teaching, Aging, and Research Lab, the University of Houston Downtown, and the Alzheimer's Association, we thank you for your time and participation today, and a special thank you to Bridge Solutions and Altus Hospice who brought us pan dulce and juice and coffee. So, those of you in the room, please take it because we're not going to take it home with us. So, please. Please take advantage of that. And we thank all of our community partners, uh, our dean, our president, and just the university community, um, students, faculty, staff, uh, everybody in the virtual world that uh, Zoomed in. Thank you so much. Thank you.